to quickly reintroduce myself in the new session here, right? So my name is Aaron Chasen. Uh, I'm a director of our cross business unit product marketing here within EMC. Um, the responsibility of, of myself and my team is to help understand the, the broad portfolio that EMC has uh, and kind of understand why we've assembled what we have and what are the different architectural models that we're really bringing to the game in the, in the industry. So super quick, the, the, the foundational idea that really start this off with is that workload demands drive infrastructure innovation. All of the different storage platforms you see out there really come from a massive diversification of workloads that we've seen in the industry in recent years. Um, it seems like a fairly simple basic statement, but it's really something that impacts every single thing that we see around us. Uh, I, and one of my favorite parts was earlier today, I heard a conversation in the hallway, you guys were talking about evolution, so I happen to have this in my slide deck too. The, this idea of workload driving diversification and workload driving uh, sort of hardware and infrastructure uh, uh, evolution over time is fundamental to how things like uh, adaptive radiation occurs, right? This is what Darwin saw when he went to the Galapagos Islands. He said, right, this finch came from the mainland. It ended up on this island system, and every island had a different ecosystem. Some of them had bugs. Some of them had seeds. Some of them had nuts. Some of them had different things. And in order to be able to survive, over time, they had to adapt their hardware. They had to adapt the architectural model or their beaks that they use to consume that food in order to stay alive. Right? We see that in nature. We see that all around us in everything we do. And it's, of course, not just there. We see it in industry as well. Right? I, used to, I, used to, uh, I actually spoke to Ford last summer, and I wanted to give them a little bit of an idea around the same idea. And you can kind of see it this way when you look at what happened to the auto industry. Right? Back in 1903, when Ford opened their doors, they tried to figure out what the hell a car was. And by 1908, they finally figured it out. They said, OK, we're going with the Model T. And for 25 years, their manufacturing practice was so, process was so perfect that all they shipped was Model T Fords. And he famously said, you can have it in any color you want as long as it's black. Because DuPont made the black paint dry faster. <laughs> <laughs> DuPont made the black paint dry faster, but it was a simpler process for them, right? To be able to get that going, make it the exact same, and get that out the door. And within a couple of years, that was pretty much the ubiquitous. This is what people were driving anywhere in the country. Now, of course, things changed for them, right? Over the course of the next several years, people said, wait a minute, that Ford guy's making some money. So maybe I should get into the industry. And of course, as more and more people got money and as more and more people started driving cars, choice started to come into play. People wanted different things out of their automobiles. And that's why over the course of a century, you saw their portfolio diversify. It went to Ford trucks. It went to um, station wagons. It went to sports cars and luxury cars. And, and you've, you've got economy cars. And eventually, of course, we need bigger and bigger cars. So SUVs and minivans and luxury SUVs. What's that? You left out the Edsel. Ah, no, I forgot the Edsel, <laughs> which is a little bit further back. That's true. Um, That's but the idea here, right, is that over the course of a century, they went from a one product company to a multi product company. And each of these products had to be fundamentally a different architectural design. Yes, you've got some basic platforms, but trucks are built on truck platforms. Sedans are built on car platforms. SUVs could be on car or truck, depending on what you're trying to get out of that particular crossover SUV vehicle. Right, but different architectures were required because people don't go to a Ford dealership and complain about, their f about the fact that they've got trucks when they're looking for a sedan. The sales guy goes, well, let me show you some sedans that you could pick from, right? And nobody buys a Ford Fiesta to bring two by fours and plywood to and forth from their work site, right? Just like most people, unless you're Tommy Trogdon in the back, don't buy massive Ford F-350s to be your daily commuter. But then again, <laughs> he lives in Texas, right? So I would expect nothing less. Um, his car is as big as my house. I'm not kidding you. Um, so this idea is that this is happening in IT as well, right? I won't get into the IDC numbers in second and third and all this platform, but the idea is over the last several decades, you've gone from where computers were basically just uh, number crunchers for small numbers of companies. You had thousands of applications that were being used by a couple of million people, right? But when the internet kind of exploded, you went to millions of applications, and now there's hundreds of millions, right? And from a user base perspective, you went from millions of people to tens of millions to billions. And if you expand that to not just human interfacing with technology, but the internet of things, it's literally trillions upon trillions of things that are generating information and participating in the broader IT ecosystem. That explosion over time has to fundamentally impact the underlying architectures that we leverage to be able to provide the framework on which those applications can run. 
Uh, I didn't do the animation of the millions of apps. All right, so how has that been driving our strategy? How does that fundamentally go from that Symmetrics company that we were 10 years ago, 15 years ago when I joined EMC, to a much broader portfolio and of, of architectures that we offer today? So you've probably, you might have seen some of these things like this before. I know that, that Josh had this in his earlier one, but I want to explain kind of what you're looking at when we use a slide like this. When you look at this, some of these workloads, these millions that have emerged, some of them are bound by performance. So the question that came earlier, are you doing that dollar per gig or dollar per IO? Are you doing that uh, throughput or is that you know, just big raw capacity dumps, right? Some applications need bleeding edge performance. They're gonna be the higher end of this chart. Some of them just need cheap, deep, dark, low cost, dollar per gig archive or content repository dumps, right? That's a completely different problem to solve. Some of them need rich data services. They need dedupe, they need compression, they need snapping, they need replication, they need encryption. And they need that and expect that from the infrastructure. Others, especially as you start moving into these newer modern applications, far much more on the left side of this. They need no data services. I just need a persistence layer to dump my stuff down. I'll take care of all of the stuff that I need at the app layer, thank you, and my programmers will build that in for me. You just give me a data plane to run my stuff on, and that's all I need from you, all right? So when we came into this marketplace 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it was a pretty simple marketplace. It was transactional processing. How do we insert memory between disk and app and accelerate financial trading on Wall Street? Pretty simple. But over the last 20, 30 years, you've seen that diversify into file consolidation, into object storage, into different types of database requirements, OLTP, data warehousing, you name it. I'm not going to go through all of these. But they all sort of land across that spectrum of performance bound or capacity, rich data services, low data service requirements. And on top of that is where you get our portfolio. No one product can possibly be the single answer to all of the workload problems. It's just not they technically told us possible. At <laughs> That's not the focus <laughs> in NetApp, right? We are not a one product company, which both brings strength and mm -hmm. that we get choice and, and flexibility and the right tool for the right job. But it also was very challenging for us because how do you wrap your brain around all of those different flavors? Going very back to the very beginning where I showed that sort of 3D chart. Sometimes when you look at a portfolio like ours, it looks like a bunch of gibberish until you take a look at it and start peeling back the onion and it starts making a little bit more sense. All right, so how do we start understanding this? Um, really what it does is it comes down to the fact that all storage in the industry today falls into four key architectural designs. All right, you basically got um, dual controller, sort of tightly coupled scale up, scale down models. You've got the tightly coupled scale out architectures. All right, these first ones are really, and I'm going to go into the details very quickly. These ones are really designed on the type ones to be for the general purpose storage platforms. They're really good at everything, but they're great at nothing. Right, 80 to 85 percent of all workloads are going to be running on these types of platforms globally. All right. Now, if you need to start scaling them out, if I need to be able to scale and maintain fantastic latency performance, I'm probably going to be tilting towards a tightly coupled scale out architecture where I've got shared metadata across all the nodes and every single controller within that system has direct access to data and I don't have to do metadata lookups and passing of that information around, giving me great latency even as I scale. If I'm simply looking to scale, but I need deep, cheap, low cost capacity, but simple to manage at petabyte or exabyte scale, you're probably looking at something <coughs> like a loosely coupled scale out model, where I can scale to hundreds or thousands of nodes, but because I'm distributing my metadata across those nodes, there's going to be a latency implication of metadata lookups that get passed across those distributed node systems. And then the type four is the stuff that's been emerging recently, which is I need to be able to scale to thousands upon thousands of nodes, but I don't need to share data across it at all. Metadata is not going to be shared lookups. I'm basically just providing almost independent persistent nodes that my applications are responsible for dumping data down onto. And if I need to create multiple copies, my application will do that for me, thank you. The infrastructure doesn't need to do that. And therefore, I'm not going to pay for that. Right? I'm not, I don't need to pay for the rich data services of a type two or three. I just want to have cheap, simple uh, you know, commodity servers out there with a storage layer on top that I can dump data down to. Now, if you start breaking our portfolio across this, let's start peeling behind the, the onion behind a couple of these things. First of all, it's important to note that any engineering decision that you make has a trade-off. I am trying to solve a problem, but in, in solving that problem, I am acknowledging that I won't address another one, or that I may even be weaker in another one. Right, trying to go and have the most bleeding edge performance means I'm going to be using more flash technology, but I'm making a trade-off in cost. Right? That's the trade-off that I'm making in doing that. 
If I'm doing something like I just need cheap, deep, low-cost storage, I might go with a whole bunch of low-cost spinning disk. But the trade-off I'm making is I'm not going to necessarily perform as well. So understanding what the fundamental trade-offs of the architectures is critical. These type 1 models, these dual controller systems, the trade-offs that they're making is that they are targeting general purpose workers. <coughs> I need to be a great balance of price, performance, and availability. I need to be able to support a broad amount of applications, so I need to certify broadly across the industry of apps out there. And I need to have good availability because, hey, small to mid-sized businesses and in, 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 uh, in the mid-market companies almost practically standardize their companies on these architectures. So I better be five nines or better. But the trade-off I'm making is these dual node systems only scale to dual nodes. If I run out of performance or capacity of those dual nodes, my only choice is to buy another array. Right? I cannot scale out beyond the performance of those two controllers. In the EMC's portfolio, that's the role of the VNX array. If you look at something like the tightly coupled scale out, this is where I now say, OK, I want to be able to go beyond two controllers. But as I scale and keep my management simple at scale, I still need to make sure I have the best in performance latency in the market. I still need to be able to have these low millisecond or even sub millisecond performance characteristics from a latency perspective. In this, this is our VMAXs and our extreme IOs. Right? They, every single node in that cluster has direct access to a common space of shared memory and shared metadata. And every node in that cluster has direct access to the drives that can service those requests. What am I getting here? Predictable latency at scale, very high resiliency. I can scale to dozens of nodes. Why not hundreds or thousands? Because memory is darn expensive. And the code and software code required to manage that shared memory is complex. The trade-off, it's more expensive. Again, memory and shared memory and the high-speed networks required for these come with a cost. And therefore, they will fundamentally be more expensive per gigabyte than the other types of systems. If you move into the type 3s, how are these different from type 2s? Right? Type 3s, I, I like to describe it as being kind of like a phone book. If a phone book is my lookup system, in a type 2, every node has the phone book. In a type 3, every node owns a letter of the phone book. And so I may not know where the C's are, at least the people within it. Let's say my last name is Chasen. If I want to go look up records on Aaron Chasen, I would have to go to the C node who would do the local lookup and service that request. All right. So fundamentally, as I scale this out, that inter-node communication and cross-node metadata lookup introduces latency. But it also allows me to scale to hundreds upon hundreds of nodes, maybe even thousands for some designs. It also allows me to do great aggregate performance, because I can now just simply get the total performance of all of those nodes in some total. I may not get millisecond latency, but I might be able to get millions of IOPS, right? but at 5 or 10 milliseconds latency. But that's good enough for the applications looking for that type of a platform. In our portfolio, that's Isilon, vSAN, and Scale.io. Other thing to note here, notice that Scale.io and vSAN are software only. So these architectural models are not physical architectural designs. These are software architectural designs. If you look at an Extreme I.O. and an Isilon array, they look very similar. They're compute nodes interconnected via an InfiniBand backend network. But how they use that InfiniBand network is completely different. The 1FS stack uses it as an RPC communication link. The Extreme I.O. uses that as an RDMA link. Very, very different in how they use that physical hardware and how that software stack's implemented. This also goes to a comment that was made earlier, that we haven't integrated our portfolio as much as you'd like. One of the things to note is that once you've created your software stack, you're locked into that architectural design. You can continue to try to patch the holes and patch the weaknesses, but you're fundamentally locked into that architecture. You cannot make a type 1 a type 3, or a type 2 a type 4. Right? You are locked in. Just like if I were to buy a sedan, Talking back to the Ford analogy before, I can bring it to a chop shop and have them chop that thing up and turn it into a truck, sort of but it will never be a Ford F-150. Right? I can patch that difference, but it's still fundamentally the same architecture that you started with, which is why as you build your stack up, if you need to switch architectural models, your only choice is to either invent a new storage product or buy a new storage company. You cannot make one architecture another. The final one is the type four. The type four is the distributed shared nothing. Right, and this is really where I've got large numbers of nodes that create a, a very simple persistence layer that data can be written down to, but it's not necessarily going to take care of the back end resiliency and redundancy. This is where Viper data services, object, NTFS, or uh, sorry, um, HDFS, <coughs> and eventually we'll be adding block and file to this as well. Right? 
and then Atmos falls into this category. So far, so good? So I guess the, the thing that um, I would wonder is if people are looking, you know, th is this the level of information <coughs> for, and if not, like what? No, deeper. Far, Technology. So far away, what's, we're diving. We're, we we're, we're, we're experts. We kind of knew this stuff. All right. I so think this might be nice for the people watching who aren't familiar with it, which is great. Yeah. It's nice. Your entire sales force can nice talk about us. this sort of stuff. The people that are watching. We would hope they could. The, yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, they can, you know, like having talked to them. Uh, yeah, they can they can cover this stuff. Uh, this is a good forum to cover the things that your local sales guys can't ever get into the technical things, the mm -hmm. you know the deeper stuff. You know, and what's, so what's differentiating you guys? Yeah. What's keeping you vibrant and pertinent in the market? Okay, so you, you can cover this in like five minutes, but then okay, so you've got products that go into this. Great. Mm -hmm. Yep. Tell us why they're awesome. Yeah. So we're, we will dive the. I think the technical depth is the next session when we jump into Extreme IO and just focus on the single platform. Cool. cool. Can we start doing yeah. that now? Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I have, I got five minutes anyway. So let me just do one thing. Um, I'm gonna say, w one of the things to note is that I, I said earlier that uh, that you can't make one architecture another. There are ways of trying to be able to patch that. So for instance, type ones. Some companies are trying to make type ones simpler to manage at scale by federating those. So think putting VPlex in front of a VNX or embedding it like we've done with our VNX CE. Think about what NetApp's done with their cluster mode. Think <coughs> about what Whiptail has done with Invicta, or Cisco with Invicta. Um, these are the types of ways where I can basically make it simpler to manage at scale by federating a management layer on top, but they're still fundamentally restricted to the type one architectural model. So things like shared data services don't exist. Deduplication exists within the fundamental dual nodes, but not across when you get to those models. All right, so with, to get through the time here, I'm going to make a quick s jump forward cool, thanks. and mention this piece here. The portfolio we s had up before seems very hardware centric. Um, we've been known as being a company that ships storage arrays. But we are absolutely, and we've been talking about this probably since 2007 or 8. I know that, um, that we on the vSpecialist team were starting to show virtual VNX back in 2008 uh, and using that in front of customers as an example of how we're starting to move towards software delivery models. Uh, virtual VNX is not a product, by the way, guys, but fundamentally it's what we run behind all of our vLabs, our hands-on labs at EMC Worlds and at VMworld, and it's something that is available for anybody to use if they want it in an unsupported state. But we are event we are slowly moving, we'll especially on the left one. side of this. Yeah. What's that? We're gonna hold you to that one. You want virtual VNX? We can get it for you. Uh yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's been available for about three years. Uh, you can get a download version of that. It's unsupported. You can get a yeah, download cool. version throw from it that if you have a machine. customer log into the EMC site. Ah. Is that true? Mm. Yeah. Let's work on that for you. Yeah, that'd be cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very cool. Um, all right, so we are slowly moving the left side of this to pure software. So Atmos, which was shipped as hardware, those types of object data services are moving over to Viper data services, which is shipped as pure software. In the upper left side, this is where Scale.io and vSAN come into play. So this move from distributed models to converged infrastructure to hyper-converged infrastructure that we talked about earlier is this move towards a purely software stack. Right? A lot of people sometimes have a difficulty between the conversion hyperconverged. And the way to describe it is when you walk into a data center and you open the door of a v of a V block, you've got Cisco UCS servers, you've got Nexus switches, you've got EMC storage, and a human being can visually see the differences between those. But when you walk into a hyperconverged infrastructure data center, it's just a bunch of servers. Right? Why? Because the server network and storage is completely virtualized on top of that hardware stack. Right, and we are putting investments in that place, in, in, in that whole Scale.io and vSAN front, and on the VMware side of our federation, of course, with NSX, which, which you guys are familiar with. And we're going to continue to expand on that. Right? So imagine virtual 1FS. If you could come out with a virtual instance of Isilon, or virtual VNX, or virtual VMAX. Right? These are all things that we've been talking about publicly. Virtual VNX was shown at EMC World last year. Uh, virtual 1FS is things that are being worked on, right? So we're going to continue to go forward in ways of being able to deliver our technology in both hardware and software, depending on how the customer wants to consume that technology. And I'll end with this one. Our new architecture is evolving, right? So you went from one bird, you know, that flew to the Galapagos, and over time it ended up being different kinds 
of these finches. Um, are they evolving? Uh, yes. Uh, we are seeing more and more of this happen, especially as you try to need to get storage closer and closer to the application. So start thinking in memory databases. Start thinking about the things that are happening around there. I can't get into that because EMC World is in two weeks. But if you want to come and hear what we're doing as far as really getting the, at the storage even closer or becoming part of that application layer, that's stuff that we're going to be talking about in a couple weeks. It'll be in many of the keynotes, but Chad will be specifically addressing it in his general session of uh, Area 52 uh, on Monday afternoon of EMC World. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to the Flash team, and we'll start talking a little bit about and diving into the Flash portfolio and then Extreme IO.